I'm Dr. Lindsay Tuba. And I'm Dr. JJ Wicker from Little Heroes Pediatric Hearing Clinic. <laughs> so today for our coffee talk, we are going to be talking about something that is, I don't know if it's controversial. I don't, well, I it's think out there. it can be a little controversial. Uh, I think misunderstood a lot. Misunderstood is a great word. So we're going to be talking about something that's misunderstood, but it's something we do here at this clinic and we stand by it. Yes, and that do. is the use of low gain hearing aids as a treatment option for people who have typical hearing thresholds but have other auditory concerns. Yeah, but before we dive into that topic, if you haven't already, please be sure to like this video, subscribe to our page, and hit that little notification bell so that as we come out with new videos, you'll be notified. So low gain hearing aids um, are exactly what their name implies. They're hearing aids that are programmed to pretty much just not provide that much amplification, which is the traditional use of hearing mm -hmm. aids. You, mm -hmm. If you have hearing loss, hearing aids help give you access to the sounds that you can't hear. However, over the years, hearing aids have become quite fancy in terms of the things that they can do. Yeah. Um, so beyond just making sounds loud, they can also help fight background noise. Um, they can also have different features that you're going to talk about for your specialty. But for me, what I care about uh, for children who have a central auditory processing disorder, a lot of times their deficits are delayed abilities in decoding speech, which means that at the at the very sound level, can they tell the difference between b or d or p? Okay, as people are speaking to them, so that's one of their deficits. But the other deficit is that speech and noise deficit that. Um, lack of ability to of their auditory brain to understand what's noise and can be pruned out and what speech and what needs to be processed for understanding. Um, and so I have found Logan hearing aids to be quite beneficial for that population to help overcome some of these barriers in addition to listening therapy to help them understand, help their brain retrain to understand what is needing to be processed and what can be filtered out. Yeah, perfect. And I love the hearing aid technology that's out right now for my specialties, which is sound sensitivities and tinnitus, uh, because a, a lot of hearing aids now come with features to put in low levels of white noise or pink noise, different types of sounds continuously into the ear. It can be um, we can change the way it sounds if it's modulated, kind of sounds like a wave or it's just a steady sound um, so that, that your child or you, if you're the one wearing them, gets that constant auditory stimulation in the brain that can help with um, hyperacusis, it can help with tinnitus, um, it, it can really help with a lot of things. Um, and, and I really love that. Another thing that is really beneficial is the Bluetooth capabilities that are in hearing aids now. So that if you or your child are on the phone um, or you're streaming something, it can stream directly to the mm -hmm. hearing devices. Um, so it's making it just that much more seamless for the user. Right. And one thing that I think is important for us to talk about is the evidence base behind them, because we're not just trying to say that this is what we do and is what should everyone should do. Um, while it's not a gold standard of practice, there's really no gold standard of practice <laughs> for auditory <laughs> processing at least. Um, but there, there is literature to support the, the meaningful use of low gain hearing aid technology to help treat some of these. There's not a lot out there. Um, and so it, it isn't something that everyone's doing. And some people, one of I think the most common misunderstandings about it is there's just this kind of black and white idea of what how hearing aids should be used. And I think that that's what is needing to be changed where people will say, well, they don't have hearing loss, so they don't need hearing aids. And I think that definitely with older hearing aid technology, that's true. Yeah, yeah. But nowadays hearing, like we mentioned, these hearing aids have these other features that can also be used for these other listening concerns, even though you have typical hearing. Um, but the other thing I wanted to bring in uh, as, you know, part of like why we're doing this and, and definitely some research behind it is the use of what are called remote microphones. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So I'll let you speak to that. But okay. it's absolutely one of the most um, one of the best things that you can get from 
these types of devices is mm -hmm. the ability to use those remote microphones. So go ahead and so talk to that. What remote microphones are is they are just a microphone that can be worn remotely by a primary communicator. So for us, we work with children. That's usually the teachers or the parents, right? Um, and the idea is that you, if a child is in a classroom listening to the teacher, if the teacher has the remote microphone, their voice will go straight to the child's ears who, with, with the hearing aids that they're wearing. So even if they're at the back of the classroom and a lot of activity is happening, the teacher's voice will cut straight to those kiddos' ears and uh, so, so that their, their voice quality doesn't diminish with that distance and with that competing noise. Um, and as I mentioned, speech and noise is one of the greatest deficits for children who suffer from auditory processing disorders. Their brains just have not figured out that it's okay to prune out these other sounds that are happening and instead they're all being processed at the same time and it's really hard for these children to understand the speech that they're needing to attend to. And so with these remote microphones, wearing these hearing aids, that their teacher's voices just come through nice and clear despite the other activities that are going on. And the parent report and teacher report on the outcomes of using that kind of technology is um, pretty mind-blowing to me. Yeah, and I've, I've had a lot of patients speak to how great it is in the car with mm -hmm. their child. You know, I mean, if you have a child that falls into this category, you likely know that in the car it's noisy and your child isn't hearing you or you think they're not listening to you. Um, but using this in the car is a great way to speak to them. I had a mom say that she was in Costco with her child and it was the only way that she could really communicate with her child because, you know, he was kind of running around not far away, but, but, you know, he was being a kid and we all know the, the type of sound quality in Costco or a large building like that isn't great. There's a lot of reverberation, a lot of echo. And she was able to wear that um, microphone and was able to, to say, Hey, Joey, uh, that's not his name. <laughs> Come back, or you know, let him know what whatever she needed to say. So we've had really, really positive. Not only the research, but anecdotally, um, we've we've seen that a lot. And also to speak to um, us using this technology in our clinic, we always offer um, trials, mm -hmm. trial periods. So that's definitely something. It's not something that works for everybody, but it does work for the majority of people. Mm -hmm. And so we offer a trial. And if you're in a place where you're looking at this type of a thing, I would recommend a trial because there are some people that are like, you know, that really wasn't helpful. And you don't want to spend all that money um, on something that's not that helpful and then, then spend money on something that is um, on therapy, on other techniques that that help that are helpful in, you know, in addition to that in in my specialty, if, if somebody isn't liking the way that noise is being streamed in, there are other ways we can get a noise rich environment for people to stimulate those auditory centers in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be sure that if you're going to try this, which we recommend on nearly all of our patients, that you have a trial period. And we find that probably nine times out of 10 100. people end up going, going with that. So. Yes. Yes. And again, I think the trial is the biggest, the biggest thing, um, because it is a chance for parents to determine if their child is a good candidate for this. Because one thing that is different that I will say, just in case there are other pediatric audiologists working, um, the other piece that kind of makes this hard for people to buy into is the hearing aids do need to be open fit. So we're not fitting what is normally fit on children in terms of hearing aid technology, we're fitting hearing aids that are usually fit on adults. But the reason for that is because they do have typical hearing. We don't want to plug their ears. We, again, going back to auditory deprivation, which is a video we had done previously, we don't want to plug these kids' ears. We still want them to have access to the sounds that they can hear naturally. Uh, we just want to boost that speech clarity a little bit. The other plug I wanted to put in before we end um, is use of FM systems in the schools, because uh, a lot of times that's where people will say, well, you can get that in the schools. And that's true. So an FM system is like a remote microphone. It is something that you can wear. It looks kind of like a hearing aid. It's just all that's all it is. It's just a microphone. It has no other features. Mm -hmm. um, and teachers, again, can wear a microphone that then streams their voice straight to the kiddo. And that is a great alternative. The only downside that I've experienced with that is it's only used in the school setting 
Whereas in auditory processing disorder, misophonia, hyperacusis, these things don't only happen in school. They're happening in the home yeah, and at yeah. church yeah. and with friends, you know. So so I I like low gain hearing aids because of their more versatile use in these different environments that aren't just school. Yeah, yeah, great. And so to recap, we're we're really just talking about utilizing the advanced hearing aid technology on these children or adults who have normal hearing, peripheral hearing, um, but we're able to take those really cool features and help habilitate or rehabilitate people um, the, the struggles that they're having with their, with their understanding, their sound sensitivities, or their tinnitus. So if you have any questions about this, because I think that you will. <laughs> Please feel free to comment uh, below or reach out to your audiologist and ask them some about some of the things that we've brought up and see what they say. We will be as responsive as possible and we um, are big advocates of this technology. Yes, we are. We've seen so much success and I mean parents come in sometimes just crying at mm -hmm. the difference they saw in their child mm -hmm. almost overnight yes. while they were wearing these devices. Yes. So um, we've just been really pleased with, with the benefits we've seen in our clinic. Yep. Awesome. Well, everyone, please have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone.